So, the long and the short of it is... How about at the end of the day, you do anything, I'm going to be really fascinated by rituals. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Good evening and welcome to this very special Rask Live. Um, it's actually daytime, my time, because I'm recording this during the day because at the time that you might be watching this, like 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night, I might be off at dinner. So I've decided that I might have to record something in advance, as they say in South Australia or over in the Pilbara region. Um, but in, a, in Melbourne, we say uh, in advance. And in any case, uh, tonight I've got a very, very, very special guest recording with you featuring Dicker Data's David Digger, and uh, we'll be hearing from him in just a moment. Um, but I know that many of you can't go without this week's joke. So I've got a few slides ready to go for you. So uh, just on this here, uh, Rask Invest is an upcoming webinar uh, for many of you that want to learn more about what Rask Invest is and why I've been working on it for 10 months. You can head to rask.com.au slash invest and you can find out more about what I've been working on for 10 months. In short, basically, there's a new service that we're opening called Rask Invest. Uh, it's a throwback to an old name that we used to have. And um, this is basically something, it's the biggest step in our business today. And basically, it's a, a strategy that you, maybe you think, and let me set the scene for you. Maybe you think, well, hey, Owen, this guy that I've been watching for 18 months seems to know what he's doing. I kind of trust the RAS name and the RAS brand. I should maybe have a look into this. Well, this is something that I would encourage you to have a look at because it's the biggest step we've ever taken with our business. And it's a chance for us to um, help more people invest, whether it's family members, whether it's friends, um, whether it's colleagues who need to invest in the stock market or all markets. Um, and you think, well, maybe... I trust the RAS brand and I trust Owen and the team to do the right thing, long-term investing, low-cost diversification, transparency, all on display. So RASC Invest is a new service that will have both an app and an online portal for you to invest directly with RASC and directly with me, um, and it launches in the next few weeks. So head over to rask.com.au. You can register your interest in this button. You can see a screenshot of what the app will look like. Um, and you can go on the list and you can also review uh, our PDS, you know, the PDS, Rask Invest PDS here, as well as the target market determination, which is obviously what everyone should read before um, investing. But uh, you, know, and you can learn about what we've been building, why we're using ETFs for the core of our portfolio. And if you register your interest, you can also book. Uh, there will be a limited number of um, opportunities, but um, you can, if you register your interest, then you can go on the, the list to have a direct chat with me one-on-one -on -one, um, because I will be doing some one-on-one -on -one calls uh, as part of the launch of Rask Invest as well. We had 1,100 investors give us their feedback on Rask Invest and what it should and shouldn't be um, and how we should approach it. Um, and I'm super excited that it's going to be launched in the next few weeks. Uh, we'll be doing the webinar, the calls, and if already had so many people reach out and um, wish us all the best and say that they're going to invest with us, which is absolutely just amazing. So um, there's a video here at the top of the page as well, which you can click on. I'll give you more information, but otherwise head to rast.com.au slash invest and be sure to register your interest. That's the best way to stay up to date, um, especially if you're a RAS member. Okay. So uh, if you haven't already figured this out, we go live every Wednesday, even this one, which is pre-recorded, it is live every Wednesday. So you can um, subscribe, whether you're on the Australian Shareholders Association on RASC or on Self Wealth YouTube channel. Oops, pardon me, as I hit the mic. Um, you can subscribe and you'll receive notifications that we are going live. Uh, so for example, here, 
Um, you can see there's a big thing that says subscribed and then it says subscribe. You click that little button and you get the bell and um, that means you'll get notifications if you've got the YouTube app on your phone, for example, like I do. Um, we've got nearly 20,000 20, on Rask now. Um, we get about 700 to 1,000 people subscribing every month for free content, podcasts, this sort of stuff. self off and ASA are growing as well, which is wonderful. So why not subscribe? Okay, here's the sad news that I've got for you this week. My obese parrot died today. Terrible news. Mind you, it's a huge weight off my shoulders. That's my joke for today. So sad news, my obese parrot died today. Mind you, it's a huge weight off my shoulders. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I'll probably be in the comments, to be honest, tonight. So um, you can still uh, shoot me a message or give us a score out of 10. Um, remember that um, Rob from Selfworth is also often in the chat, so you can say good day to him. Uh, and uh, comment away about the topic that we have tonight. So tonight we've got Dicker Data CEO, uh, Dicker Data Chairman and Founder David Dicker. We talk about fast Ferraris, fast cars, and big dividends because many of you will know that this is uh, Dicker Data uh, since it has been listed on the stock exchange. And you can see here it's up four thousand six hundred and seventy percent. So what's that? A is that a four hundred and sixty bagger? Is that what that is, or is it a forty six bagger? I mean, forty six bagger. Um, but what's absolutely incredible about this is that it's managed to do that while also paying out 100% of its profits as dividends. So it pays out 100% of the profit it makes as dividends. So it provides a regular stream of cash flow. Incredible, actually incredible. And so we can see the share price back then was 24 cents. Let's quickly jump into market index. Let's have a look at the latest dividend payment, actually like the dollar value of dividend payment. Now where are we? Uh, we can see here, so doopy doopy do. Uh, we can see quarterly dividends. It's paying, it looks like it's paying more than its original share price in dividends every year. So not only is it a multi bagger, a massive winner for people, it's also paying out more in dividends than the original share price. Absolutely unbelievable company and story. And so this conversation that we have with David tonight is going to be about, and there's another slide on this, and um, there's another. There's a conversation that we're going to have about Dicker, the business, about his story, which is just frankly remarkable, and how he got into the business of selling computer hardware, like computers, PCs, all this sort of stuff, software and whatever became Dicker Data, um, and where that idea came from and the trip that he took to the United States to start it. But we also cross between his professional life and his personal life um, and how he kind of spends his time and his money now, my understanding is he's one of the top 10 collectors of Ferraris in the world, and he's a huge um, automotive uh, fan and fanatic and passionate uh, race car enthusiast, you could say. So much so that David's bid to get a team, his own team, into the F1, the world's number one racing organization and league, he's already got, I think it's F2, F3, F4, I think from memory, but... We recorded this podcast probably a couple of years ago, and this should say uh, David Dicker, not Chris Bay. That was last week, David Dicker, Dicker Data. Um, we recorded this uh, a few weeks ago, and I think it was only a couple of days after he got the news that his team would not be admitted into the F1. And you can find out why in this conversation with full candor why that is probably a mistake by the F1. Um, and you can hear um, all about his passion for making fast cars, um, automotive, why I think we even talk about why he has a private jet and all these wonderful things that we talk about with David. He's very candid in the way he goes about things. And we also talk about the business, what you should track if you're a shareholder or investor looking at Dicker Data. So, you know, how does it, how is it able to pay 100% dividends and still grow? Does it make sense? Like, how does the math stack up? So, we talk about that and what you should be looking at, how he's fostered the team. So much in tonight's conversation that if you are in the chat and you do settle in with a nice glass of red wine, drink responsibly, or a pasta, eat responsibly, or something like that, and you sit here and you think, wow, this is incredible, go and have a read of the annual report on the Dicker Data website or using your self-wealth account or wherever you get your annual reports and have a look at what actually goes on under the hood and uh, you might want to pop it on your watch list. So in the coming weeks, we've got obviously David tonight, but Plant One, I know you're watching, I know you're listening, not in a weird way, you're just watching and listening. Um, shout out to you because you reached out to me on Twitter this week and it prompts me to go and get in contact with Mike Kemp, Dr. Mike Kemp, who is the author of the Ulysses Contract and a former analyst at Barefoot Investors Blueprint. Um, Mike is 
he's just a national treasure, honestly. Like he is a wonderful, wonderful investor. Um, he's a brilliant communicator and he is so exceptionally well read. He's probably this book, the Ulysses contract, I think is the best investing book from Australia, like within the Australian context that I've read as least as long as I can remember. I'm sorry to everyone else that's been an author or has written a book on investing in Australia, but this has got to be at least for me, the number one book that I've read this year, maybe even last, like it's just unbelievable for anyone that's interested in uh, long-term investing and what actually works in the stock market. It's a game changer. So go and read the book. Um, where is it on my desk? Oh, I think I've put it in the other room. Um, but go and read the book, pick it up from Booktopia or Amazon, and then come to the the, 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 the RAS Live in two or three weeks, and you can ask him some of your, con uh, your questions. We're going to get him to uh, go through about four or five things from the book that I thought were just profound, and then we're going to answer some questions. Um, we've also got many other guests coming up. In fact, just after I record this, I'm catching up with someone who I hope she will be on the show in the next few months as well. So there's so many great people coming up on Rask Live. Um, I just don't have time to tell you about it today. But uh, tonight we've got uh, David Dicker uh, from Dicker Data. So we recorded this a few weeks ago originally for the uh, Virtual Investor Summit for the Australian Shareholders Association. Uh, it's a wonderful conversation that have first appeared there. I know hundreds of you also attended that summit uh, online. Um, thank you to the ASA for putting it together. Um, but the, tonight's conversation is really about getting inside the mind of an investor who likes to keep things simple, who has a very clear view of the world and how things should be done, and then just going for it, talking about personal life, professional life, financial performance, operational performance, competitive advantage, all of that. This is just a real kind of like exploration, I could say. So I hope you enjoy. And please let me know in the comments if you watch this after the fact or in the live chat. Please let me know um, because we do. I've got about four of – I'm very blessed. I've got about four of these in the bank um, or it's just sitting there ready to go. So if you want to uh, get more of this type of thing in your Rask Live life, um, let me know because there's more to come. All right, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to myself in the past tense, but future self, I don't know how that works, and David Dicker, the chairman and founder of Dicker Data on the ASX under the ticker symbol DDR. Bye for now. David, thanks for taking some time to chat with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, I bought a Tesla recently, and uh, I'm not a cars guy, not nothing like you are. I'm more of a motorbike type of guy. Um, and I've got to say this road car, um, in my opinion, from my very limited understanding seems to have changed the game. I'm curious to know what you think either of the cars or of the company. Well, I like Musk as a person. Um, he's got a few crazy foibles, but in the overall scheme of things, I certainly like his values and the way he goes about things. But the problem with the cars. And look, we've done a lot of development work here on the electric car side as well. We've got a, a 650 kilowatt motor that's the size of a paint can and, <laughs> you know, a lot of stuff there. But the biggest problem that the electric cars have got is that there's no excitement or passion in the electric car because there's no sound. And look, some of the, the cars, I've got a ton of cars, but some of the, my most favourite cars are old Fords with, you know, loud exhausts and not much interior trim and all the other stuff. And and the Ferraris, of course, again, you know, most of the Ferraris have got aftermarket exhausts on them and they provide a level of entertainment that you're just not going to get in an electric car and it's a massive issue in mm. that regard. The problem is the electric cars are great as a transportation device and, of course, that's what the government wants because especially in Australia... The government doesn't want you to have fun in a car. They really don't <laughs> want at all. You know, yeah. they, they, <laughs> they want you to consider a car purely as a transportation device and the idea you're going to have fun in it's just something they don't want at all. So that's really why I see the issue with it. Um, from a transportation point of view, it's a good solution. The electric motor is vastly simpler than the petrol engine and... Um, they're much cheaper to make, they're going to last longer, blah, blah, blah. The only real issue, of course, is the batteries, which are a nightmare, and batteries are going to be much more of a nightmare going down the track because everyone's had experience with chemical batteries going back as a kid. Mm. And 
because there's such a strong media push for the electric cars, you don't read a lot of stories about the issues with the batteries because they don't want to talk about it. But but the batteries are not going to um, are not going to last, and they're going to be super expensive. Look, I just give you an example. I got a 488 Challenge race car, and mm. I bought this car in I think 16 or 17. So you know, and it's done about 8,000 kilometres of racing, and it's had a lot of use and. Mm. It's got a lithium battery on, you know, for the onboard start battery. Mm. And we put the battery charger on it all the time. But anyway, cut a long story short, that battery's died after, you know, six or seven years. <clears throat> and the the quote for a, a new battery from the agent was five and a half thousand New Zealand. And we managed to just get a get a replacement, in effect, battery. But it's still two and a half thousand dollars, and the battery is is like you know it's only just big enough to start the car. It's mm. like a starting battery, just like in a, in a regular car. So when you scale up to the batteries that you need to run the cars, the costs are just you know the costs are just going to be really high. The battery packs are not going to last too long, and they're going to be a massive issue, and it's going to be a big problem. So. The the Tesla community kind of has this view that, and in the US in particular, that it's about eight years useful life. They guarantee up to eighty percent of of like new, and they have reduced the modules and the the battery packs inside them. But I've often had this question: like, what happens with the batteries after? So you do discard them, or you do need a new module. Like in your case, was there any opportunity to reuse that, or like how do we solve that as a manufacturing industry? Well, obviously, that can only be solved by a very sophisticated recycling operation that involves taking them apart and getting out the the various things, and that's going to be very expensive mm. and difficult, you know, and not something that the end user can do. So, mm. it, um, you know, look, the real issue is like with all these things, and the older you get, the more obvious it is, is that Everything's got a, a political agenda to it, and the electric cars are, are no exception. Like the, and the other thing that you notice about, like, say, with climate change talk, is that most of the focus is now on on private cars. Oh, we've got to go to electric cars to save the planet. Well, the private car is about four percent of the emission base, so mm. it's just completely irrelevant. But of course, it's something that's easy to attack. It's easy. It's an easy media story, and you know, like it's just, it's just crap, really. I mean, like it, it it's not rational. It's not addressing the real problem, which is power generation, and the real problem with the power generation, of course, is that yeah, wind and solar is great, but you haven't got a baseload duty cycle capability there, and mm. you absolutely have to have that. Now they're going to solve that with what a shed load of chemical batteries, but you know, like. If they could find something that was a that was a better chemical battery or a better battery with a completely different technology, of course it'd be world transforming. But mm. you know we're nowhere near it. Like mm. I'm aware of, and that's a real problem. But it, the, the real issue you've got is that you can get about um, you can get about the same energy out of 40 litres of petrol as you're going to get out of a 400 kilogram battery pack. <laughs> and that's the real issue. Like the energy density of petrol is just far ahead. And if if there wasn't so much politics in the whole thing, you could just say, look, we can, trans, we can transform most industries and housing and all the other stuff to various um, renewable energy things but let's just keep petrol for transportation because it's 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 basically a better bet. But they're not going to do that because of the politics. Mm. It's almost like, well, it's, yeah, you're right. It's all just a political cycle. Um, well, look, yeah, if they sure. shut down Australia, like, you know, why don't we just shut down Australia, give it back to the Aborigines, and we will have made you know, a great sacrifice for the climate. But, of course, no one's going to do that. And even if we did do it, it just wouldn't make any difference. We only make 2 or 3% of the output and it just wouldn't make any difference. And yet 
as compellingly logical as that is, it doesn't have any impact at all and everyone's still going on about, oh, we've got to do this and we've got to do that, and it's completely futile. I, I find it fairly amazing that um, people can even be so irrational because until mm. they get, until they stop emissions in India and China, nothing that the rest of the world does is going to make any difference. It's as simple as that. Mm. And everyone who's got any brain cells at all knows it, but yet they act as if it's not true and that we should be doing all kinds of other stuff. Like it's, it's frightening irrationality. This conversation is going to segue and flip-flop between ticket out of the business um, and what you've achieved, but also your pursuits. I'm curious, there's a question that I, that I have for you, which is, so you've amassed this wealth, right? You've been super successful in business. And this relates to what you were just saying. Do you think that there's some type of responsibility, say, not just for people like you, but also for people like me who are a minnow, right? Um, for people like us that have the ability to make conscious choices around where we, like, what kind of cars we buy, where, where you, what problems you try and solve. Like, do you think humans and our society has a responsibility to do that? I'm not a massive fan of the whole virtue signalling type of thing. And, and the other issue, look, look, one of the things that irritates me about all this stuff is that we are living in the absolute best peak time of whole of human history. Mm. The living standards are, are better than it's ever been. And, look, I'm 70 years old, so I can, I can rem remember back, you know, 50 years with these. And people are so much better off now than they were even 50 years ago, let alone 200 years ago, but yet the way they whinge and howl, you'd think that, you know, the end of the world was imminent. It's just crazy. That's the first problem. Like, when was the last time you saw a science fiction movie put into the future that didn't portray the future as a dystopian hellhole? They always do. They always do. And yet there's no way that's what's going to be the case. You can be absolutely sure of that because human progress is just going to move it forward and it's going to be the complete opposite. Yet you just get this large percentage of people in the West who just basically want to shit in the nest. It, it's some kind of psychological, I don't really understand it, but mm. and it's very prominent in the media. You know, mm. constantly, oh, we're shit, we're crap, you know, blah, 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 this is wrong, that's wrong. And But in reality, we're living in the best times that we've ever lived in i think that's worse in australia than it is in new zealand and i think it's worse in new zealand than it is in the united states that would be my assessment like i think we've got a, a sh oh you said it we've got a shitload of tall poppy syndrome particularly here in australia uh, where we don't champion success i think we shoot it down <laughs> i just it really frustrates me because if you look at innovation it's people who take risk that pushes those things forward and that's what i mean like for example like with the the whole Elon Musk thing, which we were just mentioning before, like he came out with Starlink, and I knew that that wasn't as effective as my MBN connection fiber to the you know curb or whatever it is. But I bought the Starlink anyway because I wanted to buy it. I wanted to see how it works, and I wanted to also play a role in helping that technology and supporting that technology, even though I didn't have to. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Although I must admit, I'm not as virtuous a person as that. <laughs> We actually use it here because in New Zealand, obviously, because of the, the mm. dynamics of the country, the internet can be a little bit tricky when you're out of once you get out of town. And you know, we found it to be pretty good. Um, mm. I, to be honest, I talked about a system like this with our guys inside of Dicker Data ten or twenty years ago, but obviously, we didn't have the money to put up all the satellites. I mean, it's a no-brainer for sure. Yeah, we got New Zealand's got Rocket Lab, right? So. Um... There's a lot going on that's trying to be involved in that space race. Um, okay. So, I mean, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. But um, before Dicker Data, you grew up just outside of Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. Feel free to correct me on anything as we go. Um, and you weren't, as far as I understood it, you weren't, well, you hated school. That's the quote that I got from the AFR. Um, you thought it was like prison that you could get to go home from at night. Um, well, that was high school. High school. I liked primary school. Um, 
But, you know, I didn't even realise in primary school that you were supposed to study. I never even studied for the exams. They just showed up and then right at the end someone was telling me about how they'd spent all weekend and I said, what are you doing? Um, so, you know, primary school was great but high school was crap and, yeah. Yeah. Do you, did you have any fascination of compu- for computers or technology at that time? No, I got um, – I only got into computers completely by accident and as well I was never one of these entrepreneur type kids, you know. I was never – Honestly, I didn't really care about money when I was a kid. Um, Mm. uh, I can remember having a part-time job when I was probably 10 or 11, putting stuff into mailboxes for two hours every afternoon after school, and it was taking up all the free time I had. I was getting next to no money probably anyway, so I gave it up. So, Mm. no, I was never one of these kids that was, you know, the five, ten-year-old entrepreneur crap, and Mm. I had to into computers because... um, I started doing this stuff with my, in my father's business and we could see that um, the, these computers were going to be the way to go. Look it, look, it was so bad. I wrote this software that had um, mathematics in it, trigonometry, and I had to dredge out all my old high school textbooks and relearn the stuff that I never really learnt when I went there to be able to do it. <laughs> and no, I, I didn't... Um, the only interest I had in high school was sailing. Right. That's interesting. Um, do, you, do you sail now? Because I know you're on the plane. Uh, I yes, I, I, I sold my boat. I had it in Sydney, but it was difficult to get over and whatever, so it's yeah. gone. Yeah. And I, I sort of thought about getting another boat, but really I just the opportunities to use it are so limited that it's not really viable. Yeah. You, you you said in a Forbes interview that you did that you don't really enjoy doing things unless they're very hard, if not impossible, like they're considered impossible. I yeah, imagine in the early days yeah. with programming, with, with with programming in the early days, it would have been bloody hard. Like today you've got like all these, you know, things that do it half for you. Um, but if you weren't that interested and you had to dust off the old textbooks, I imagine that would have been bloody hard. Um, yeah, but uh, one... Once I got into the computers, the computers captured my imagination and I was it, it was great. But, yeah, programming was completely different. And I had to teach myself. I didn't have anyone to do it. But mm. especially in the early days, so everything was very well documented. And one of the things that you can say in favour of the Americans is that they do document their stuff exceptionally well. So basically if you can read and you're not a moron, it's pretty easy to teach yourself this stuff, so I did that. But, yeah, it was programming at the, at the low level, like assembly, you know, the machine code level. It, which is, for most people, that's something that they'll never even look at. Um, I, most people don't even understand any of that stuff because the pro, the, the, what they call programming now is so far above that that it's just yeah. you know, crazy stuff. Yeah, it's, it's so high level what we do now compared to that. Um so my understanding is that your old man had a it's like a trust business, like a roof trust style business. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah and um, sorry, go on. He started out as a builder after the war. Well, he was he he was a barrister. He didn't like the law, so he started building with his father, and um, they got into making the equipment for making the roof trusses. So we used to stamp out these metal plates and make the machines to, you know, press them yep. together. And that's what we did. And so all those pieces of wood had a certain length and angle to them and every house is different and there's only like, you know, 20, 25 trusses in a house. So in the old days they just sort of lay it out like with a pattern, which is very slow. And we decided to, well, our consulting engineers decided to use these programmable calculators to work it out and we decided to buy one so that we could um, just keep an eye on what they were doing because, you know, they were mega buck expensive and I was going better with than they were. We just took it over and that's where it went, you know, and then... You know. Did you, if I'm not mistaken, your old man sent you to the US to get some computers and bring them back so you could use them. Is that what happened? And then what was the story from there with the distribution? I went. You know. Oh, right. Okay. So, 
I got in, involved in my father's business because my parents wouldn't, in effect, let me alone and just let me do whatever I wanted to do. Like when I was in high school, I was in fifth year, 17, mm. and I wanted to leave high school and apprentice as a sailmaker because, you know, I was sailing and mm. they wouldn't let me do it. You know, they wanted me to go to university and all this other crap and I didn't want to do that. And I did this refrigeration mechanics apprenticeship thing, which I found as dull as dishwater. And then my father said, oh, well, look, why don't you take a job working in this plant that uses our equipment in Adelaide and maybe we can get something out of you, blah, blah, blah. I went down there for about six months. They offered me the job to manage it, um, but I went back and basically I just took over my father's business. Like He was still doing the day-to-day stuff, but in terms of the strategy and all the other stuff, um, Fiona and I just basically took it over and my father was old and tired and he didn't care or stop me and he wasn't like probably Rupert Murdoch where he was, you know, like <laughs> so we started buying these computer magazines because, you know, you could buy these computers in Australia and you, you could see all this stuff in America and then we just sent off messages to America and lined up stuff and I flew to the States with a bit of money and bought machines and brought them back and took it up from there. How did it go from that then to selling? Because I remember in the early days you had some, I think it was like a, I don't know, I read somewhere it was like you wanted to sell 10 computers a month or something. I can't remember what the figure was. How did it go from that? So you just literally bought them from the States, brought them back here and you started selling them? Well, we needed the computers to, for this software that I'd mm. written for my father's business, but we only had 40 fabricators, so we had a very small customer base. Um, but it was obvious that these microcomputers were going to be a big deal and it was obvious you were going to be able to sell them. So we, we could see that right from the start. I mean, a blind man could have seen that. So we just started to sell them in the in a, as a regular business in effect and outgrew what I was doing there pretty quickly and then we just moved out to another building and just took it up from there. Mm. Mm. In the early days, you were selling direct, right? You were selling direct to people that would buy the computers, but that changed, well, right? We sold about we sold about half of the machines to end users directly, and we sold the other half through a dealer channel that we built up pretty okay. quickly. Yeah, right. And then eventually, we we got out of the end user sales after a while. Yeah, yeah. And is that because was there like in the early days? Could you see something happening, or was it just like messy because you're dealing with? retailers or selling to customers like is this messy well it was different because the end users were almost all technical people that had a very clear understanding of the programming and all the other stuff so it wasn't much of an issue and obviously dealers well they just sell to whoever they sell to and they manage it so we Mm. only had to supply the equipment so it's all pretty straightforward hmm uh, totally unrelated to this, David. I actually just remembered something. You mentioned the sound of the electrics before, the electric cars. I actually love the sound of the electric winding up because it reminds me of a plane taking off. Yeah, I agree. The, our electric motor runs at 25,000 RPM. Oh, right. And um, I still think there are some possibilities with it, but um, they haven't been explored to any great extent and they're going to have to be if you want to get success because – the sound part of the of the car is just such an important, you know, part of it if you're in, interested in it. And I guess the only thing that maybe is in favour of the whole electric car is that it'll completely separate out the enthusiasts from the people who just want to get from A to B. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about road and cars for people that aren't familiar and particularly the, the, the type of cars you're making? Um, because I was looking at the specs before and I was trying to think to myself, I think it was like zero to a hundred in, I'm going to guess, I can't remember, it was two point something. And interestingly, it was only like 700 kilos or something. Well, the car that we built is not really a not to 100 mile an hour type car, you know, mm. like it's half of the track. It's an open wheel car, um, similar to an F1 car, not quite as quick as a current F1, but not that far behind. And, it's it's built for the track, mm. so um, totally but we, are, we are building a new car which will be a two seat closed car 
and we are going to build both road and track versions of that and we'll probably build both electric and petrol versions at least on the road we'll probably only use the petrol motor up for the track but hmm. hey, so when you i know that you were thinking of this for a long time in, in fact i've heard you say it was something like 10 years and then it was only around 2016 or so that you started to take it really seriously i'm just really interested in this idea of like that's an ambitious target to try and build a car that could get into the f1 right first of all that's people will hear that and be like well surely like red bull mclaren all these people that organizations are looking at it thinking how can anyone else do this better than us right so how what was like the first step like did you have to get a team because if you did how did you find them yeah we started with a few guys i mean I'd done a fair bit of work on the project just myself because I designed the F Zero, you know, from scratch. All um, oh, right, I didn't know. I got that. to a stage where I had enough money that I figured I'd be able to, um, I'd be able to fund it no matter what, which is how you've got to be. You know, you've got to be in a position where whatever you have to do, you can do it. And I was in that position, and so I thought, well, I might as well do it. I'm not getting any younger and I've always wanted to do it. So let's do it. And so like you obviously, you're not day to day involved. That's my understanding with Dick Adata. You're, you're CEO and chair, but obviously you've got some wonderful team members, which we'll just talk about in a moment. But um, how did you go and find the people that you would need, the engineers, like just anyone? Like how did you f take those first steps? Oh, well, you advertise and you talk to people and we recruited guys from the university in Christchurch initially and we still have a relationship with them and we know guys there and, you know, you just, um, you know, you just cast around. Mm -hmm. you know, like it's not easy, but... Did you, you have know. to steal talent for that? Like take talent from somewhere else? We mostly started with young guys that were mostly graduates or whatever we we don't have a lot of real experienced guys which to be honest is probably a mistake we probably ought to get a few of those be yeah, it's going to, yeah because obviously the technical things are really important but also is that that, that real experience um because I, I would i would i would i would guess david that those types of people who you want if you're taking them from somewhere else would cost millions of dollars i, I kind of i i, 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 I you, no well, look, there's no, there's very little racing car work done in New Zealand or even in Australia, and there's plenty of guys who'd like to do it, and there's tons of Australians and New Zealanders that have gone to Europe because that's where they had to go to, right. to work in it. So it's not as it's not as hopeless as it sounds, you know. Right, right. Um, and I know you've got like a, a track at home, and and you do all the you have all the facilities there. Um, why did you decide to set up the facilities, say, in New Zealand versus – I know why you didn't set it up in Australia for what it's worth, but maybe that's worth talking about quickly. But why not Europe or North America or something like that? Well, I probably would have been better off to do the project in Europe or the UK, to be honest, but the problem was that my business was in Australia and it's just too far away. I mean, I, like, it's a two-and-a-half-hour flight from New Zealand to Sydney. Yeah. So, you know, and the time zone is not much of an issue and everything. So it's still viable. And I was never going to be like most of these guys that do these projects where they put everything they've got into it and end up with nothing. I didn't want to end up like that because, you know, there's nothing worse than being old and poor. <laughs> you want to avoid that one. Yeah. So um, doing it in Europe was never really... Um, an option i would have had to go and live in the uk or live well you'd have to live in the uk because i don't obviously speak french or italian or german so you'd have to do it in the uk and it'd probably be the best place to do it and it's just too far away basically you know to be sort of viable because you know just like it's a very long flight from heathrow to christchurch no matter which way you do it you know like even you know and you're not going to be able to do it um, like it, it uses up to like, like a return trip the amount of time that it uses up sort of makes it difficult to only be in one spot for a week like look one year I think it was when we were doing the express data thing I did 30 or 40 trips between Australia and New Zealand wow you know 
because I'm, I was a non-resident of Australia, so I didn't want to spend any more time there than I had to, and I didn't want to anyway. And so, you know, like, that's a lot of flying. Mm. And it allows you to get a lot of stuff done. And, you know, when you if you were trying to do that from Christchurch to London or even Sydney to London, you just couldn't do it because you just can't. So I heard something. I don't know where I heard this. Correct me if I'm wrong. I heard that you like to be within 90, is it 90 minutes of your plane at any one time? Is that true? Oh, well, it's, it takes an hour and a half to get to the plane from from my house. Okay. Why did so, you get your own plane? Is that just pure flexibility? Like you can just jump on a plane, go wherever you want at any time? Well, you know, getting a private jet was something I always wanted to do. Mm. I used to, you know, where the private jets sit out at Mascot. Mm. Well, you know, I live down south, so every time I went to the airport, I'd virtually go past them, and you're always looking at it and thinking, you know, this would be great, not going to be possible, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. And look, the, the thing about the private plane is that you've just got a level of flexibility that you're not going to get with the commercial flight. And I was, you know, I was an Emirates flyer and I was on their IO program, so that's their highest level of whatever. And it's absolutely fabulous, but you still don't have the, the flexibility you've got with the private plane. And even though you're flying in first class and it's fantastic, it's still not the same as when you're flying on your own plane. And it's just a vastly better way to go. And look, the the private plane flies higher and faster than even the A380. And so, you know, like I, I get from Sydney to Christchurch usually in two hours and 20. I get from oh. Christchurch to Sydney in two hours and 40. And, of course, the plane just noses up to the to the um, the FBO there at Mascot and i got a 10-metre walk and I'm in the car and I'm gone. You know, I show my passport to the customs guy and that's it, um, you know, and same mm. on the way out. So you just can't, you know, you just can't beat it for that. The only negative, of course, is the astronomical cost. Yeah, I heard you say that you have to have three pilots for this. Uh, basically, or like a pool of pilots, which cost you, I don't know what you said, something huge. Um, but I guess it, once you get to a certain point, right, it's not <laughs> which you're at, it's not really that type of trade-off, is it? It's more about the how do I want to spend my time rather than how do I want to spend my money? Well, look, you can't justify it in terms of the cost, obviously, but... Mm. You know, what's the point in busting your ass and making a ton of money and then dying with all that money in the bank? I mean, that's what my father did. Like, my father made money, not not anywhere near what I've done, but he, he because he was brought up in the Depression, he just didn't really enjoy spending his money. And, hmm. you know, he used to say, oh, yeah, but I can buy anything I want. And I'm sure he could, but he never did. Hmm. And I was always telling my parents, I said, don't bother leaving me any money, just spend it. But they didn't. He was a prisoner of war, wasn't he? Yeah, he spent three years in Germany. Yeah, well, I guess that would do things too. Like my family's Holocaust survivors. No, um, I, don't, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I talked to my father about the war quite a lot, you know, and um, I don't think he was traumatised by it in any in any way. And but then he wasn't a he wasn't a you know a glory hound either. Like you know he never went to any Anzac marches or any of that kind of stuff. And you know he didn't mm. uh, he didn't. I don't think he was affected positively or negatively. Really, well, probably more positive than negative. I don't think he was traumatized uh, at all. Mm. Um, yeah, right. So, more of a personal question then. Did- in those days, and they are now. <laughs> yeah. Did, 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 did that affect you then, Not like you're seeing him amass wealth from business and not spend it? Do you think you overcompensated or have in any way? Like- I'm sure my parents would. <laughs> I'm sure they'd say that. It's, it's <laughs> a shame to me that I'm not able to go around there and pitch him up because I know it would burn up. <laughs> um, Look, in 1980, just to give you an idea what they were like, um, mm-hmm. In 1980, I bought a Corvette. It was a second-hand um, thing. And um, we had a van 
for the business, which we used to go to and from the business. Corvette was just a fun car. But Ford had decided to build a car that was a bit like a throwback to the Falcon GT in 1980 called the um, ESP. And I'd ordered one of these cars oh, way back, cross knows. Um, anyway, I get a call from the Ford dealer one day saying, oh, you remember that Ford? You, that, well, do you still want it? And I said, oh, yeah. I guess. Anyway, I bought it. <laughs> And my parents just totally flipped out. I remember my mother saying, you can't have two cars. Like like my parents had a car each and that was, you know, like, yeah. So I don't know what they'd make of it now. They'd just be totally, you know. <laughs> did you know that you were going to be wealthy, like from a young age? Like did you, because it seems like, like what you said before is you didn't know no. you want to get into computers no. and all that. So no, yeah. not at all. And look, I, for years, um, you know, money was always a limiting factor, like always, you know, like it's sort of, I can, I can still remember things like, um, okay, I was only a kid, but in 1970, my father bought this Falcon that we sort of shared. And I remember he paid, I think, 3,300 bucks for it. And the Falcon GT was about 4,200. Mm. And the gap from that 3.3 three to the 4.2 was like insurmountable. You thought, God, we could never, just couldn't, you know. Um, and, you know, later on, look, it's, it's only in the last sort of, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so that I've really had, you know, in effect, tons of money. Mm. And I never had any real ambition to get a lot of money either. Like I said, I wasn't one of these child entrepreneur guys and I wasn't really driven to get money and in the business we try to run it the way you should run it but the money is a byproduct it's not a, it's not the aim mm. do, do you manage your own money or do you use like wealth managers how does it work i just i've always wondered that like as someone who's in like financial planning investment management that's what i do right for a job but like i don't deal with obviously people like yourself david so I don't know how you make those decisions. I don't. Uh, well, I haven't had to worry about it for the last five years because all the spare money's gone into road and cars. So yeah, they true. haven't anything left over. But I used to trade the US stock market and I started yeah. Yeah. in 1997 and I did that up to 2013. And especially for the first probably 10 years or so, I traded the markets every night and said, you know, sitting in front of a computer. Then I ran software to do it, wrote software to do it with computers. So, you know, I know the US markets well. And if I had spare money, I'm actually, I am dredging up some spare money and I am going to go back to um, the US markets, but I'm not going to trade them every night like I used to. I, I'll, you know, trade them a bit more long term, but. Mm. I'd, rather, I'd rather run my own money than give it to someone else. So it just, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was actually an interesting thing that I heard. And I can't remember the number. I think it was either 80,000 or 180,000. I, I don't know what it was. But in an interview, you said something like, I started with, say it was 180, and I had $3 million a few years later. And then you, I think, I'm just going off what a memory here. Your old man said, how did you do it? And you just said you buy things that go up and you sell things that go down. Yeah, that's all basically right. It was 180 grand. It took a year or two to run it up to nearly 3 million. Um, I lost probably half of that or so in the dot-com crash, but I still came out way out in front. And, yeah, look, basically, yeah, it goes up and you buy it and if it's going down, you know. I mean, so you've got to remember that markets in general go up most of the time and all you've really got to do is avoid getting too severely punished when you get the pullback and then work out how to get back in because you know they they you know they generally go up obviously you know. yeah i so this what we're appearing on right now david is is on behalf of the australian shareholders association but it's also the australian investors podcast so it's like the biggest investing podcast in the country so i speak to a lot of fund managers, entrepreneurs, CEOs, people like yourself. And I'd never heard a story like that. Like you hear about them from, say, Jim Simons, you know, who runs Renaissance Technology in the US or whatever. But I'd like to double click on this if I may, because this would be like very interesting to the audience. 
So you're basically doing like a, you were doing like a systematic trading thing, basically something that you could automate. And I'm imagining you were using like some type of signals based on price volume, maybe even fundamental data. It's all based, it, it was all really just done on price movement. Simply price movement, right. And would your holding periods be like days, measured in days, hours, weeks, months? Like how short term is this? It was a day trading thing. So basically you try to be in cash at the end of the day. Yeah, right. Did you learn any of this from someone or like did you study this in any way? No, it was another one of those self-taught things, I'm afraid. I read quite a lot of books on trading, but not so much books on how to trade, but books with interviews of guys who were, who had traded successfully. But like I said, it's just not that complicated. I mean, you know, it starts to move up. And you and look, in the period I traded, although it's not, it's not really any different, but in that period, you know, the market was incredibly volatile and it, it's it moves around a lot and you trade shares. I, I traded mostly tech stocks, obviously, because I was a computer guy. Mm. And, you know, they move a lot. I mean, all you really got to do is, you know, get in there and, and um, you know, it's not really that difficult, I, I don't think. I feel like so a lot of the things – sorry. With, the problem you've got with the share market is that the fund managers and all these other guys, they need to try to make themselves look like some kind of guru so they can attract money. And the, and the fact is most of them can't beat the index. That, that's the reality. And they spend all this time, you know, analysing stocks and looking for this and looking for that. And I read a lot of the anal, anal, um, analyst stuff on our company and, and whatever, and I just laugh because they just don't really know the company and they don't really know the industry. And... I, I stopped going to the analyst meetings years ago because you can't tell them either. And it's all kind of amusing, to be honest. Yeah, but there, I feel like there are many reasons for that, right? That there's the whole, they're very myopic, first of all. They, they're incentivized. The incentive structure is completely out of whack. Um, and then you've got simply ignorance, of course, which we shouldn't look past. Um, but I, I was going to say something like you seem like you, so you describe things as being very simple, right? And indeed, some of those things would be particular, maybe, and maybe this is, is in the eyes of the beholder, you know, you, you see these things and you think this is the essence of this problem that I'm going to solve. D d would you say, would it be fair to say that you're smarter than the average Joe Blow that gets on, gets around on the street? Look, who knows? I don't know. I did a few IQ tests when I was a kid, and I think when I was in primary school, they IQ tested everyone. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I think they did two tests, but I had to do three because I think no one ever tells you anything when you're a kid, but I think what happened was there was so much difference between one of the tests and the other one that I had to do another one all by myself to, and but I, but. They don't tell you what the outcome is, so you don't really know. Who knows? I don't know. Do you think – so one thing that separates, I think, separates like entrepreneurs and even good in investors and just people in life is like a variant perception, right? Like there's the person that goes through the park and they take the, the, the pathway and there's a person that just goes straight through the bush and tries to discover something new. I, like some people see the world differently to other people. And you seem to be one of those people, and I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I don't either because the problem is that I just see it the way I see it. Um, of course, I often say to the people that most people see the world the way they want it to be. I see it the way it is. Um, I'm a realistic person and, and a rational person, but like I, I don't know how other people think and. Look, I don't have a wide circle of friends or any of that kind of stuff, so I'm not in a position to even really know what the other guys think. And it's hard to – it's hard to – look, most people that are smart or, in, in effect, in terms of tests and that, they do well because they've got a good memory. Like if you've got a good memory, you're going to do well on in most sort of tests. But – 
that's not intelligence, that's memory. And the intelligence is the ability to sort of, you know, one and one and get it to three type stuff, you know, that sort of see the see the possibilities and all that stuff, you know, and all that pattern stuff. Mm. Just like, on your brain. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Um, but when Fiona and I were married and we were sort of together for about 20 years, we didn't really have any real circle of friends. We went to work every day of the week. And when we weren't at work, we used to go around to my parents' joint to watch the football. So yeah. you weren't exposed to um, a lot of stuff. And, you know, I don't go to cocktail parties with people and, you know, chat about stuff because I just don't do that kind of thing. So I really haven't got a clue, to be honest. Does it? So you don't go to those analyst things anymore. Does it shit you? Like if I was to sit here and ask you questions about the most recent set of financial results and blah, blah, blah about the company, would it, would that, that would be, I'd imagine, not very stimulating for you? No, I'm okay with it. Okay. Look, the reason I don't like the analysts is because they don't, they don't look at our bit, they've never looked at our business individually. They lump us in with the sort of the industry type thing and that's the part that I don't like because if you're going to be successful in business it's competition and you've got to be better than the other guy and you've got to have strategies and execution that makes you better than the other guy and they just don't they either don't understand it or they don't want to admit to the idea that some of the companies are better than others you know look look our company is just much better run than any of our competitors and We've got the profits on the board over, you know, 20 or 30 years to prove that. Like I'm not, that's not rhetoric, that's just a fact. Um, mm. Ecodata is the, by far the most successful distributor in Australia and New Zealand over the last 10 years if you want to talk about um, profits, mm. even in terms of sales, but obviously profits are actually what, why we're there. And, you know, we're far ahead of the other. We operate... We, we deliver, you know, net margins that are just better than what the other guys can do and that's all there is to it. But the analysts just don't seem to understand that. Our shares should be trading way higher, for instance, than they are at the moment if you looked at it on performance, but we're held down because of the, you know, the rest of the industry is having a bit of a struggle. So you you think you're thinking that people put Dicker data, they put that in the same bucket of research as they put technology one or insert name of other technology company, and they go one has wide margins, one has slim margins, one has debt, one ha doesn't have. I don't know what technology one has by the way. I'm just guessing, but like that's what they do, and then they go this one not good, that one better type thing. No, they just sort of. They don't give you any credit for being better than the industry. They just say, well, this is the industry. But the industry profit margin is 1% to 1.5%, and we do 25 to 3%. That, mm. That's basically it. And But we don't get rewarded for that extra. Look, I'll give an example. Mm. We nearly sold the company to this Chinese company called HNA back in about 2000 and, oh, God knows, 14, 15, something like that. I don't know, 17, 16. Anyway, mm. um, it was going to be, oh, shit, I think it was a dollar thirty-eight a share or some story. Anyway, they just bought Ingram Micro, you know, worldwide. And mm. so they decided to, in effect, throw the deal to the Ingram Micro M&A team. And the Ingram guys came back and said, oh, you can't buy this company. These numbers are wrong. No one can make this level of profit. <laughs> and, you know, like we've never done any, any um, you know, accounting tricks or any of that kind of stuff or any of that stuff, and we've never tried to sort of optimise things to pay less tax. I mean, we pay the least amount of tax we can, but we've never done sort of tricky stuff or any of that sort of thing. And we've always had a completely open book, like even with the employees, even in the early days, you know, it was all pretty open. Everyone knew what the company was doing and, and everything. And now it's a public company. Obviously, everyone knows. So the runs were on the board, but they just wouldn't accept it. So I think a lot of the industry, like the finance industry, needs like the spreadsheet, right? They need to go tick this box, put that in there. 
and they don't take a lot of things on faith because they don't have a way to quantify. Yeah, that's true. So, it's, all, it's all done on, 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 on parameters and no one's making it. Look, it's like when you go to the bank to borrow money. Um, the bank's got a certain number of criteria that you've got to reach to, to borrow money and that works out how much money you can borrow. They won't operate on the basis that, well, okay, we'll give these guys X, but we'll really keep an eye on what they're doing. They don't want to do that. They don't want to manage their loans. They don't, the bank doesn't manage the loans that we have. Look, uh, yeah, of course we have, a, we have a rep and we have all this sort of stuff, but they don't really manage the loans even now that we're a public company and we deal with the institutional part of Westpac and that. So that's, and, and of course, because they don't do that, they basically make less money because they don't get on to some of those good things that might be a bit risky but could be good because they just don't do them because they won't fit into the, you know, they don't fit into the spreadsheet. Mm. I actually had um, a guy called Joseph Healy on the show maybe beginning of this year. He's the CEO of uh, Judo Bank in Australia and he talks about like the basically the, the different C's of lending and one of the things was like it's basically all collateral. You know, it's got nothing to do with the character, um, which is which is a really interesting thing, and it probably that probably happens more at the pointy end of like VC and equity type raise. No, but, it um, yeah, um, I can remember going back to when I was only in the thing for five minutes. Um, you go to the bank to borrow money. The first question they ask you is, "Do you own your own home?" Yeah, because then they'll be able to leverage against that. So they don't. They don't want to do any. Um, they don't want to do any lending based on cash flow and management. They just want to do it on assets. And if you've got the assets, you can get the money. And if you haven't, you can't. And that's that's it. That's how they want to operate. Here's a, here's a financial question for you for the business. Then, how does it impact you if interest rates have gone up? We make less money. Hmm. Okay. It's as simple as that because. Our business is is operated entirely on borrowed money. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the structures we we dividend out one hundred percent of the profit, and mm. so we operated we operated completely on um, on borrowed money because I think that's the way it should be done in terms of the whole whatever. So if interest rates go up, then um, you're going to, all things being equal, you're going to make less money. It's as simple as that. And you can't avoid it and you can't mitigate it because any any saving you made, you make in some other area to compensate, well, you could have made that anyway and made more money. So it's it's really quite simple. If interest rates go up, you're going to make less money. What happens if interest rates go up, you guys go into a loss and then the interest bill basically stacks up, if you understand what I'm saying. Oh, so well, the next refinance is bigger. They'd, they'd have to go up to levels that they're not going to ever go up to before you were in a position where you couldn't make a dollar. When I'm when I say we're making less money, we're talking about you know maybe five million bucks in a year. Oh right, okay, yeah, it's a very small. We're talking about fifty. We're talking about you know two, three, four, five million. We're not oh, right. talking, about, you know. Um, one of the things that kind of allows. The and look, I'll give you another Sorry. example to just to, to to offset on that, right? We've always owned our own building. Right? That's one of that's another one of the things that we've always wanted to do. Mm. Now we built a we built a factory out at Cornell and then we built another one next door because that one wasn't big enough, but we couldn't get it built in time. We sold the one we were in and we rented it for about a year and it costs $2 million a year to rent, right? Now, mm. we built that factory for $24 million and we sold it for $36 million. So we mm. made $12 million on, you know, on a capital gain from owning the building. And if we hadn't have done that and we were there for about 10 years, we would have spent about, you know, 15 to $20 million on rent. So... That's a that's like a thirty five million dollar swing. Mm. So 
it, when you talk about um, things like the interest rates, then you have to take into account things like that because the rent, like on the factory, the factory we have now, the rental on that factory would easily be, I don't know, be somewhere between five and ten million a year. So that'd be five, you know, five or ten million a year less that we'd be making. Mm. Mm. One of the things that seems to hang together for me with the business is culture like it just it's pretty simple you've said that before so many times um and i know when you set the business up a big focus of it was having a workplace that was accessible basically for women um and i know there were in the early days that was a not necessarily a focus but it was just something that you had um where it was more women in the business than men um I, I want to talk about incentive structures, but I want to do that separately. Can you tell me a little bit about like how you have fostered a culture that works for the business? Because if we're to take what you're saying on faith rather than on the spreadsheet, say, for example, like we trust you, it's in, it's in the data, like you, you're right, 20 years of success, but we're basically saying we believe that what you're saying is true. It's pr- proven out but also we're going to take that as truth going forward can you talk a bit about that culture as like the the way that ex, that explains what you do so well if that makes sense i don't know that's a horrible question but you kind of i think you can get where i'm going well, look with with the employees um people go to work because they want to earn money so obviously you want to you want to i've never been one of these guys that thinks that you know, the, one of the keys to profitability is to squeeze down the wages as low as you can get them. Um, mm. I wouldn't like to be treated that way, and I just don't think it, it works well. I think that basically if you pay people more money than they they basically get elsewhere, they're going to work harder and they're going to be committed and they're going to just be more interested and the net result is they're going to perform better. And, look, we're in competition with our with our competitors and our only measure of success is being better than them and if you're going to be better than them a lot of that's going to come from having better people it's pretty obvious really so you you pay people more money you treat them better and you know you you give them sort of other sort of benefits so the the reason we started well look i was married to fiona so there was just the two of us in the beginning (laughs) And she was a fantastic performer, you know. And look, even when I went back, I go back to primary school, um, my, you know, out of the top 10 smartest kids in the class, I think eight of them, were, seven or eight of them were girls. So I never had that sort of, um, you know, women of stupid attitude or any of that kind of, kind of thing right from when I was a kid. And we offered this sort of nine to three type of um working environment for you know mothers who were wanted to return to the workforce and obviously it worked really well fiona could sort of pick up the slack before and after and you know it just worked well so you know we were giving people an appealing situation and they depreciated it and we were paying them well and you know whatever and and look fiona especially was very good at um making that sort of internal culture where everyone's treated well and it's sort of, you know, you have functions and, you know, all the other sort of stuff and it's sort of, it's not like it's a grim Charles Dickens type of working environment, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. So yeah. people can enjoy it and, you know, they spend a lot of time at work so you want to try to make it pleasant. Nowadays you have the... Um I would say it's quite unique in that you have effectively a profit share with based on profit margins and profitability, which makes a whole heap of sense when you think about how simple that is and how aligned that is for people. But you pay well, like your executives get paid good cash bonuses, which is interesting, right? Because if you listen to like the Buffets and all those of the world, they're like long-term incentives and X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. They do have a lot of skin in the game. And you've, been pro- you've promoted a lot of those people internally. Um, is like is, is that is that something that other companies of your size get wrong? Like they 
they they don't promote internally. They don't share the spoils of what we know moves the dial, which is money. Well, look, look, the other guys just have much more rigid structures and all our competitors are foreign multinationals. So all their structures are set offshore out of Australia and so they don't have any kind of local sort of feel to them. And, look, the guys running all those companies are mostly Americans or American-educated MBA guys and so, of course, they tell you all kinds of stuff and blah, 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 but... You know, look, I, I I try to be a rational thinker and just think a problem through and get what I think is the right answer. And the reality is is that if you want to incentivize people in general, there's only two ways to do it. You either they either get to work less hours, that does work at the low end, but at the higher end they get more money. And it's it's not even complicated, but I mean, who's going to bust their ass for nothing? I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to ask someone to do that. Like, you know, I, I feel that you should pay people well and then you can push them. Hmm. But the idea that they're just going to sort of do it for some, I don't know, it's just crazy town really. And the way it's worked with our sort of top executive guys is they wait, they make way more money than they could get at any of our competitors, like, you know, far, hmm. far. And even our even some even our lower down management guys make way more money than they could working for anyone else, and and yet we make more money than those guys as well as a company. And the reason we do that is because look, you, if you want to get an out, you want to get output from people, you've got to appeal to their self interest. This this sort of idea that you know we're in a community or or <laughs> Shit, you know, like it's <laughs> and the academics and the media guys, they love it. You know, that's why communism just sort of won't die. You know, the, the sort of the, but it's just bullshit. I mean, you've got to appeal to people's self interest if you want to get an outcome. Yeah, there's only so many beanbags you can put in the, uh, the welcome area or the whatever, right? <laughs> it's all garbage, you know. Yeah. Um, Okay, so two more questions on this. One is, what would happen if you're not involved in the business anymore? To be honest, in the short term, there'd be no, it would nothing would change. Like I go to the board meetings every month, and obviously I check the emails every day, and I have, and I look at the sales figures every day. Um, in the short term, nothing would happen at all. I I think in the long term, I doubt that our ironclad adherence to sort of our core principles would be maintained yep. and that that would be the risk but if they if they were maintained then there'd be no issue but i'd see that as the only only problem because look it's very easy to say oh we need to change this or we need to change that or we can't do this or we can't do that and it's not easy to just say no we're doing it. Look, I'll give you a good example and probably told you this story before because I've told it a thousand times. I had this Chris Price guy working for me as a sales director. We were doing the Express Data deal and before we started to do the, before we basically pressed the button to go ahead and do the Express Data deal, I said to him and Mary, she's my CFO, yeah. I said, I want... Um, what was it? I want 25 million in profit. It's either 25 or 30. I want um, 10 times inventory turns, and I want 5 million sales per head. And if you can, if you, I think it was 30 million profit. Um, and I said, if you guys are committed and you're going to deliver that, then we'll do it. But if you don't think we can do it, let's, we're just not going to do it. So they, they were real keen to do it. So we did it. And we're in there and we're doing the integration and Price brings me up on a Sunday night and says, oh, I've got to talk to you tomorrow, blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, okay. So he comes in the next day and says, oh, we can't do 30 million, we can only do 25. And I just said to him, well, I'm just that's just no good. I'm just not going to accept it. They're like, you know, sheaf of paper and all this. And I just pushed it back and said, no, that's no good. Hmm. So... He pulled out a paper from his bag to resign. So he resigned on the spot. 
and I got him to call Vlad up, who was um, an internal, one of our internal sales guys, and I'd, he'd been there, I think, for five years. I'd only, you know, I used to say hello to Vlad a few, every now and then, you know what I mean? Mm. And I said I offered the job to Vlad. Vlad took it up, and Vlad has proved to be a much better performer than Chris was, and we've even hired Price back to run a part of the business. But in that situation, most people would have caved and just said, oh, oh, okay, you know, and then when you do that on the important things, you just put yourself into a position where you're going to be screwed and you're not going to be able to get out of the hole. It's like the 2.5% margin. Like everyone knows that the 2.5% is non-negotiable that we're not going to do it if we can't get that number and that's all there is to it. And we're not going to change that and I don't care what anyone says because that's a fair number that ought to be achievable and if you can't achieve it, well, there's something wrong. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a great – I haven't actually heard you say that. Maybe, I've, maybe I have, but I can't. That's a – as someone who runs a business, I can appreciate that. And it's a slippery slope, isn't it? You kind of just start to fall off the side of that curve and by the time you know it, you've got 1% margins or whatever the competitors yeah, you have. you can't get back. That's the real issue. You can't get back. You know, like it's – look, we bought Exceed in New Zealand and their sales per head, I think, were 1.8. Our target is a number between 4 and 5, so 4,000 odd. So we we have got it up to now, I think it's up to 2,600 and we'll get it to where it needs to be. But it's only iron-fisted determination to get it there that will get you there because it's hard. Mm. You know, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. But the problem you've got is if you don't get those kind of metrics, you're not going to get the outcome because that's just the way it is. So you just can't... Um, you can't really compromise unless you want to get screwed. So, okay. So my final question around this is like on the business itself. If I'm an investor, there's a lot of people that watch this or listen to this that would be investors in the company. If I'm a, if I'm looking from the outside and I don't get to see you chat with Chris or Vlad or do all those types of things, what things should I be looking for or like to know if you've made a mistake? Is there anything that I – does that make sense? Yeah, well, the, the obvious thing is the numbers, you know. Look, you know, we we have a quarterly thing and if we're not getting the number, there's a problem. Mm. Like I'll give you an, another example. Um, we used to pay – like we pay four quarterly dividends a year and we used to pay the first three of them on a conservative number and the last one would be on a, a higher number to get us up to the 100%. Well, last year we decided to try to get it so that all four quarters would be evenly balanced so that there wouldn't be this sort of big uptick right at the end. I wasn't that worried about it, but Mary wanted to try to sort it out. Well, because last the last financial year was a bit difficult uh, for the the first time we couldn't make, we didn't make that number. So we were, I think we were doing 13 cents a share the first three quarters and we ended up doing two and a half because we only, we made basically the same amount of money last year as the year before. Normally we would have been up, but because of the COVID and all the other stuff, you know, we couldn't do it. And our share price was absolutely hammered because of that, um, that decision, and obviously we're going back to the old way now, um, and they're mm. the kind of things that you got to, you know, look at. Mm. Look, basically, it's all about performance. You have to perform, and you have to get the number. And we've got a long history of getting getting the number. We've got an upward trending chart in terms of you know sales and profits. And as they say in those ads, past performance is not a predictor of future <laughs> gains. But what the fuck is? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I often think about that a lot, actually, because the, I think I feel like the only reason we have that in place is for people because people are myopic; they're short-term focused. But eventually, it's a it's a rhyming machine, right? Like it it, it eventually starts to show something similar if you have a repeatable process. Um, Look, you just did our company with the sh- a twenty-five. Um, what was it? Twenty cents a share. 
and even today the shares are trading at I don't know what it is today, but they're trading at nine fifty odd or something like that, and mm-hmm. they've been as high as you know fifteen dollars, and there wouldn't be that many um, sh- there wouldn't be that many shares on the Australian market that in a, in that ten or twelve thirteen year period have delivered that amount of um, capital gain while also paying out, a, you know, a substantial dividend every year. Like mm. it's got to be one of the, it, it'd have to be one of the better performing shares, I would have thought, over the last 10 years. No, oh, absolutely. It is. But it doesn't, that doesn't have any real impact, certainly not on the analysts. They, they just don't see it. They don't seem to see that at all. If because they're always complaining about the hundred percent dividend, they're always telling us to, that we shouldn't be paying out a hundred percent dividend. We should be, you know, keeping some of the money and, you know, just philosophically opposed to it. The reason we pay out the hundred percent dividend is because that's the best outcome for the shareholders. Hmm. If you think about it, why wouldn't it be? Hmm. You get franking credits. Well, just the whole thing, like it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. And our business is not tremendously capital intensive, so you can do it. If you're in a business that was very capital intensive, then you wouldn't be able to do it. You'd have to set a much lower number because you've got to raise that money and you can do it with borrowed money, but sooner or later you've got to pay the borrowed money back. Although when you're a public company, you can just basically raise that money by doing an issue, and that's one of the reasons I like the public company so much. Well, that was going to be one of my questions to you, is like why do you like the public company structure? But that would make a lot of sense, right, because you've got an extra pool there. Um, the thing is, if you're a public company, your company's going to be worth three or four times as much as a private company, mm. it's much more liquid. That valuation is a lot more certain as well. But the other real advantage is that you can issue shares. It's free money. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like yeah. It's, it's, you know, like, and especially if you think about it purely from an operational standpoint, it's just a complete total no-brainer, you know. Mm. I don't uh, understand any of these people that talk about going back to making it a private company. It doesn't make any sense at all to me. I got a pointed question, which was in. 2021, you sold some shares and the, the stock, I was reading this in some article that I was reading and there was a bit of, and I, I felt like the the article was, that was written on this was pretty stupid, if I'm going to be honest. Um, not, it wasn't like from what you said, it was from what the reporting was. It almost made it like such a big deal. Um, but it fell 21% in three days after you sold some shares. Uh, and then you had to write a letter basically to say, hey, like, hold on a second, this thing's still... Like I still have this many shares and all this sort of stuff. Like does that, that would frustrate you though, wouldn't it? Like having to put up with that or am I wrong? I wrote the letter because it was pissing me off. <laughs> no one wanted <laughs> me to write that letter. But I felt that I had to because it was just really doing, you know. So, yeah. Look, <laughs> and, and look last year when we had the bad dividend quarter, I, I, I got abusive emails from investors and all the other sort of stuff. But, look, honestly, who cares? Fuck them, you know. <laughs> well, it, at the end of the day, I think most people, in fact, everyone should be taking comfort in the fact that if it doesn't perform well, if it's 21% in three days, it's a lot worse on you on paper than it is on anyone else, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. But that was only a temporary drop and it got it went, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, my shares are not worth anywhere near as much as they were a couple of years ago, and I've probably fallen off all the rich lists in Australia. I mean, I don't get the Australian papers, so I don't even know whether I'm on it or off, and I don't care. Um, But, you know, it's a long-term game, and I know that they're going to get back there. And, look, our shares will get to 20 bucks in the the not-too-distant future, I'm sure. Mm. I think the economy will pick up next year, and blah, 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 and, you know, we're we're expanding as usual and all the other sort of stuff, and it's, it's um, look, our whole shares are Warren Buffett 
type of share, you know, like it's not that exciting. It's not that sexy, but if you sit on it for a halfway decent amount of time, you're going to come out in an exceptionally strong position. It's exactly the same. Mm. Mm. Um, so I just got a couple more questions and then I mean, I could talk all day, uh, but I guess back to the cars and to road and cars, the mission that you wanted to set out to do, one of them at least it seems, was to get the team in the F1. Um, and we're recording this in late September and the news came out this week that effectively you're not going to get your team in. And again, you kind of set the record straight. What does that mean for you to not have the team in the F1? Oh, look, I only, I only did the F1 bid because when the opportunities for this type of thing come up, you've just got to take them. Like, to give you an idea, and I didn't even bother putting this in the press release because it's not really relevant, at that bid cost half a million dollars and we didn't get it back. We had to lodge a half a million dollars with them to, to be in the thing and we, d- we didn't get that back, so I lost half a million bucks. <laughs> but And I knew I was going to lose it if I didn't get back in. I was never confident that we'd get in, not because we didn't have a good bid, but I just didn't think we would from the political side. But when those opportunities come up, you just got to take them. That's it. You just have to because that's just the way it is. I mean, and if 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 someone can't understand that, then that explains why they probably didn't get where they wanted to be in life. Because I had to do it because I just had to. And if you can't understand that, I can't explain it. But I'm not concerned because, as I said to all the people that I work with. Um, I was really ambivalent about it because if I got it on the one hand, I'd think it was a it was a fabulous achievement. Mm. On the other hand, if I didn't get it, I didn't have to worry about all that money that was going to have to be put into it. So I I couldn't really lose no matter which way it came out. So at the moment, I'm I'm um, I'm relaxed because of the I don't have to worry about all the financial stuff that you'd have to do to do it, which I could do, but it's a lot of screwing around. You know, so mm. yeah, I, I was always going to be fine. What like I was depressed the one day when we got the email. It was a Friday. Mm. By the Saturday, Sunday, I was fine. It would be so, like it is, but you know, it, yeah, I I am very primitive in my understanding of this. But you were putting forward effectively the first female driving team as well, um, for a long time. Um, no, there's only there's only been one decent woman in Formula One, and that was Lil Lombardi in nine in, in the seventies. Mm. Most people weren't even born then, so you probably weren't. No, and no. Um, we're only going to put one woman in because we got two seats. Yeah, um, but look, it's a no-brainer because I'd already had Jamie over here and tested in our cars. And we have, and I've supported Liam Lawson, mm. who's also tested here, and another kid that we got racing in the UK at the moment, and she performed just as well or better than they did. So I'd have no hesitation in putting her in in the car, and I wouldn't be thinking it was a, it was tokenism because she'd be able to get the outcome in the right car. I'm absolutely sure of that. Mm. Yeah, and it, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll leave it to people's. Not hopefully not your their imagination. You can go and look up road and cars, and um, what David's done there, uh, and how that all fell, and um, the PR release that followed. Uh, but you know, from my perspective, it seems like a big missed opportunity. Um, not for you necessarily, but for the the, the racing body itself. Um, yeah, they made a huge mistake, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for more reasons than just self interest, right? So yeah, uh, look, look. look. They, they, well, look, I lay it out in the press release. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah, I've um, got it in front of me. You know, we, we, we provide an, a, a geographic diversity, but they call it a world championship. They don't have a single team from the Southern Hemisphere, and they're going to put Andretti in. Americans have won two world championships Mario Andretti and Phil Hill. Australia and New Zealand have got five. Alan Jones, Danny Holm, and Jack Brabham won it three times. And mm. as well, the McLaren team was started by a New Zealander. 
So we've got a heritage down here that, that really should demand that we have a team down here if you're going to talk about all that geographic stuff. And let's face it, outside of um, Sauber and Toro Rosso and Ferrari, all the other teams are, are UK teams. So seven out of the ten teams are UK teams and Andretti is going to be based in the UK as well. So mm. your argument that it's a world championship could be, you know, challenged at least. Mm. Um, it's true or false, are you the world's fifth largest owner of Ferraris? I would never clue. Uh, I've got a lot of Ferraris, but uh, I think the only... The only claim I'd have on the Ferrari front that would probably hold up is that I'm probably the only owner who's got a decent number of cars who's still got every car he bought new. <laughs> but that only goes back to 2000 and, well, it goes back to 95, 96, but it really goes back to 2010. So there might be someone somewhere, but I think that would probably be a fair Mm. Mm. Cool. Well, um, this has been wonderful to chat to you properly. We've chatted once before, but it was brief. Um, hopefully get to do it in person one day. Uh, if you do decide to start resume, uh, to resume trading the US equity markets and you achieve returns like you did before, can you please just send us all a, a message and say, here's the opportunity to be part of it? Because, uh, mate, i got to say that's uh, <laughs> That's uh, that's something special. I know that's not on your radar, but uh, if you are ever doing that, they'll let the rest of the world know because it uh, it would be a great thing. But people, I, be- I, I'm not looking to get those kind of returns. But you got to remember, you got two to one leverage in the US market, so that doubles your return straight away. Mm. True. Yeah. So, True. You know. Um, people who are watching this or listening to this please go and check out the business ticker data. It's on the ASX under the ticker symbol DDR. Um, heaps of disclosure in the quarterlies, uh, or, sorry, the half yearlies, the annual reports. Um, take an opportunity to look at a business that is dominating its industry. If you're looking for one, this is one that you should be watching. Um, and I hope this cleared up a lot of the the kind of mystery around how the business is such a success. I know there's a lot of secret sauce, but this Hopefully, did some justice. So, David, I really do just appreciate you, mate, taking the time to to join me on your.